1965, the United States was deep in the Cold War in preparing for its battle against communism to firmly establish democracy in Vietnam. The U.S. would send almost one in ten of all Americans of the baby boomer generation, over 2.7 million soldiers altogether. 58,000 U.S. soldiers were killed, which is only a fraction of the over 3 million Vietnamese military and civilian casualties of war. Most Americans remember this horrible tragedy to a fairly deep extent, but relatively few Americans know that at the exact same time, Indonesia could have entered the same fate, becoming yet another proxy war. Instead, the United States successfully supported an internal shift in power from communism to democracy, yet at the cost of more than one million Indonesian lives and supporting a corrupt government for years to come. Only recently have the horrors of this period come to surface, Indonesia's horrible genocide. Indonesia is a large archipelagian country in Southeast Asia, the fourth largest country by population. Its terrain is beautiful, with rich and diverse natural resources. It is marked with the highest density of volcanoes in the world. In many ways, these active volcanoes are symbolic of Indonesia's political history. In 1945, after World War II and the Japanese invasion, Indonesia became a free country. It was at this time that a man named Sukarno, who strongly defied Dutch colonialism, was appointed as Indonesia's first president. Sukarno was credited as the architect of Indonesia's Merdeka, or in English, independence. President Sukarno, who was a supporter of Japan during World War II, was ready to make some changes. Influenced by China, he began making the nation a more communist, authoritarian, guided democracy. By 1962, his military and communist influence through the PKI, or Parte Communis Indonesia, was widespread. During this time, the United States backed rebellions and even ran bombing runs in Indonesia until 1958, when an American pilot, Alan Pope, was captured. President Sukarno denounced aid from the United States during a deep economic crisis and withdrew Indonesia from the United Nations. In 1965, several top officers in the army banded together and refused to support Sukarno's communist rule. In an attempt to maintain power, these officers were kidnapped and killed. Sukarno announced this over the radio, edging the people of Indonesia even closer to communist ideals. President Sukarno's plan had a critical flaw. General Suharto, a young officer who opposed Sukarno, was on leave and avoided the murders. Upon hearing the news of his senior officer's murder, he worked to avenge them. Suharto took charge of the armed forces of Indonesia. In a move to take power, he began to kill innocent communists and ethnic Chinese. This swift change in power and the ensuing genocide caught the attention of the United States. Overlooking these killings, they focused on a bigger Cold War strategy. Since Suharto was fighting against communism and for democracy, the U.S. supported Suharto by sending him war supplies directly. Suharto's forces took over small villages and large villages alike overnight, instilling widespread fear. Major Anton Tan, an ethnic Chinese medical doctor in the Indonesian army, was stationed in Surabaya during this dark period. You look at the, the television, he look like a, somebody who was like a family type person. He smiled a lot, but you never know what inside his heart. He must have a wicked heart that he was able to order a massive killing of people who may or may not be innocent. People were routinely kidnapped in the middle of the night. In the morning, bodies of suspected communists and ethnic Chinese were floating down rivers and fields were filled with blood. Alvir Tan, Dr. Anton Tan's wife, also witnessed the events of this genocide. Can I have a cousin that was taken at night, during night time. Uh, he was still a young man with two or three little kids. They took him in the middle of the night because they assumed that he is communist, while well, he wasn't actually, and he never came back. Even in big cities where it was safer, the members of the police and army were feared. Many Chinese were assumed to be communist and forced to pay money 
beaten in the streets, and their cars were burned. Chinese students' school records were dismissed, and universities would not admit Chinese surnames or students who looked Chinese. Some people will come to the house and they will ask for money. And I was telling them I have to ask my husband first. So, and he said, yeah, go ahead, ask your husband. And he used the nickname for Chinese. Uh, and I said, okay, I'm going to call the army hospital. And that was where Kupa worked in Indonesia when you are in, you have a position in one of the army and they know that, they knew that I dial the military hospital and right away they said they changed my name into like man. They have to give, they never came back to our house and we were never bothered by them anymore. Terrors like this carried on through 1965 and 1966. In 1967, Suharto finally took control of the entire country. Suharto was appointing acting president until 1968 when he was voted president. Sukarno died two years later in 1970 and Suharto remained in power for another 30 years, overseeing his corrupt version of democracy. Triumph and Tragedy Without a doubt, 1964 to 1967 marked a period of time that was a horrible tragedy for Indonesia. After two years of Suharto's raids and horrors, the casualties numbered over 750,000 people, and some estimates believe as many as 2 million Indonesians lost their lives. It was really, really horrendous. You know, it was also against my religious belief. I thought, how could it not be solved without killing us? And, uh, I was just praying and hoping that it would never happen again. Many families were separated or killed entirely. Many people that were imprisoned were not released until 1975, eight years after Suharto first overthrew Sukarno. On the other hand, the United States saw this period as a great triumph. Democracy won against communism, and unlike the war in Vietnam, the transition occurred with minimal U.S. military engagement. Professor John Rusa at the University of British Columbia states that if Suharto failed to overthrow Sukarno, the U.S. likely would have sent troops and announced an all-out war against Indonesia as they had in Vietnam. In the West, it was perceived that the voice of the people won against the voice of oppressive communism. The truth is, oppression was greater under Suharto's democracy. The uh, influence of Suharto continues. In other words, there was no really democracy. You still have to be careful talking in public. You just cannot say something wrong about the government. That's, that's how terrible it was. It was really a dark age for me. Had Suharto never come to power, would Sukarno have overseen a peaceful communist country until today? Would communism have thrived, or would it stifle religion as it did in USSR and China? Would the United States have entered into another costly proxy war? Perhaps what is most amazing is that this was a mostly untold story until recently, and only in 2017 did the U.S. government begin to release the over 30,000 pages of documents that were hidden from the public, detailing the U.S. involvement in this period. Indonesia today is very different than it was before the rise of communism and the horrible genocide that cost many lives. It is now a thriving democracy, the fourth largest country in the world, with a growing economy and the world's largest predominantly Muslim nation. How many years can a mountain exist before it is washed to the sea? Yes, and how many years can some people exist before they're allowed to be free? Yes, and how many times can a mountain ascend and pretend that he just doesn't see? Indonesia's citizens will never be the same and will always remember this great political triumph and a horrible tragedy.